Welcome to Podcasts Across Worlds. I'm your host, Lehua Superfina. And I'm the co-host, Spirit, a.k.a. Papa Fulu. And I'm One Eye. Our guest host for today's episode. We are people who like to read a lot of manga and watch a lot of anime. We realize that we all like similar titles and we could talk about them for hours. So here we are in Podcasts Across Worlds to talk about anime, manga, and everything else we're interested in. In this episode of Podcast Across Worlds, we are going to talk about Beastars. We've all read the manga and watched the anime. So in this episode, we are going to go really detailed about the unique story of Beastars. We're going to talk about what we liked about it, different features, theories, and more. So let's start with what Beastars is about. What it's about is a multitude of things, which is kind of going to be more of a group discussion because a lot of it's open for our interpretation but one of the main things is about the different social classes that live in the world and you've got like still got the upper class you've mid class and all that but you've got the divide between the herbivores and carnivores and even those are differentiated like this covers a lot of racism between two different Mm -hmm. food chains the two different uh, categories yeah two primary categories in regards to that yeah and how it's all social impacted like you still got friends between the two different ones but when there's the event that happens at the very beginning which starts the social divide and starts people looking at each other differently other than friends like potential enemies or aggressors or even murderers Mm -hmm. and when you first see how lugosi who is the main character of it how he enters it it starts off as a more imposing force before you actually get to understand what he is and see how he progresses throughout the manga and the anime. One eye, can mm-hmm. you explain what is a beast star? Yeah, so it's a weird thing in that um, it kind of falls into that uh, issue you sometimes find in anime where high school is the center point of existence. But uh, it seems to be like the equivalent to being like it's like a combination of being valedictorian and class president of an entire school. However, um, it is often used as kind of like a catapult towards uh, greater status socially within the uh, world of this anime. Most people who attain the title of B-Star go on to be like well-known politicians or athletes or celebrities. And it's a minor plot point for secondary characters in this story. Hmm, that's a good thing to mention because I know Spare and I, we've been reading the manga and we're pretty up to date with the chapters um, that's been updated and they actually explain more what a B-star is <laughs> while in the anime, they just explained it in uh, during the high school area, <laughs> high school moment. And so in the manga... The chapter that matches up with the anime is, I believe, chapter 47. So that's where Spirit and I will be talking about, up to chapter 47. Mm-hmm. And if we accidentally talk about more than or beyond chapter 47... Why don't I put your fingers in your ears and just go la 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 la? <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> so... So what Spirit talked about was different classes, the herbivores and carnivores. I found that really interesting that it did reflect like in our world between the races. And in our world, we have multiple races. There's a lot of discrimination and prejudice, how people are treated differently for multiple races, ethnicities, groups. There's just so much categories. While in Beastars, it's two groups, just two groups. Well, two primary groups. Um, the fascinating thing about Beastars in regards to that is that the distinction between herbivore and carnivore and the sort of like social pressures that come from being either one are not complete one to one comparisons with any one group within human society. Like there's a lot of overlap between the, you know, the two and races, but it doesn't neatly fold over. It's not a direct analogy. Neither is it a direct analogy for the difference between um, men and women, specifically physical differences. But it gives you a, it gives basically everyone, regardless of what walk of life you're from, a 
point of being able to relate to characters on both sides. Mm -hmm. Like it allows for a greater insight to that end. It allows for greater insight into the psychology of the characters. So what Mm. I found interesting was, okay, you guys can correct me if I'm wrong. So in their society, they are trying to coexist and the carnivores are making an effort to not eat meat in, in the public society. In public society, they're trying not to eat meat. They don't eat meat. That way they can coexist. Well, it's not so much that. It's more the fact of they... It's not they don't eat meat. They The older carnivores will eat meat, as you find out in the black market. Mm-hmm. And it's open. And it's even to the point where it even says that you have hospitals donating oh, yeah. bodies. Hospitals, morgues, funeral homes. Yeah. yeah. These all donate bodies to the black market. The black market is known about, but it's not talked about. Well, that's mm-hmm. why I said like the public society, uh, publicly. Well, uh, it's, it, I want to say it's so much in the public society because it's known about and it's seen as the necessary evil. Yeah, it's not talked about directly. And uh, you f- find that mainly with the panda. I forgot his name <laughs> right now. The way it seems is that Carnivores are superior physically, right? They're more powerful. And there yet- are there are variances depending upon like the animals, but by and large, yes. Yeah, so in large they are. And so but they are trying to accommodate to the herbivores. That way they can coexist. But because of their instincts, their their natural desire to eat meat, they mm-hmm. come in like a mental conflict. Well, yeah, it's it's a uh, it's specifically the predatory instinct, the hunting instinct. Even with you know being able to compensate in the diet, or even if they are like eating meat from the black market, there's still that desire to hunt that can kind of complicate things. Right, and then uh, with the whole society, they want both carnivores and herbivores to coexist. But then there are carnivores who feel like they are being oppressed because they feel like they have to hold back their strength. They have to hold back their natural instinct, monitor themselves just to let the herbivores feel safe. And they feel like that's not fair. So when something bad happens, like a carnivore eating a herbivore, they feel justified because they were making an effort to restrict themselves just for society. Well, one of the ways that they also show that the carnivores are trying to change face and appease the herbivores, the mayor, who is a lion, even speaks about having his canines removed mm-hmm. to make him more approachable and friendly to the herbivores. So you've not just got the whole mentally changing what they are, they're also physically changing how they appear and everything like that because they need to show that yeah we're not going to attack you we want to coexist but it's more of a putting on a face than actually yeah. changing who they are and the black market shows that and like I say the panda who when he speaks to Lagosi and says yeah it's a necessary evil but even to that point it still needs maintaining as he main- as he explains that he had to rehabilitate certain carnivores and once some got the taste of meat. It was all consuming to the point where they'd even try and eat themselves. They'd be that mentally deranged, mm-hmm. wanting this pleasure. When you see in the drama scene with the lion who had no the tiger who has the rabbit blood. Oh, uh, Bill. Yeah, uh, how it's doping. Yeah, it's 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 a it's like a high. He, using it as a performance enhancer and. You get that great scene between Lugosi and Bill. Oh, man. <laughs> Lugosi was giving him hands for a minute. Let's let's talk about that scene. Or I guess um, I guess they'd be pause. <laughs> <laughs> Explain what happened in that scene from um, beginning to the fighting. So you guys mentioned the rabbit blood. But explain why was the rabbit blood introduced? What happened in that scene? Well, the rabbit blood was used as a performance enhancer and more an anti-anxiety because it was to keep the senses keen and to keep the mind focused. I suppose it'd be like someone who smokes getting a nicotine fix before. You know what what I think it's specifically um, it's stoking that sort of like uh, that hunting mentality, that hunting mindset. 
um, and this is one of the things I really like about uh, B stars is that while their society mimics our own, uh, the author never forgot that you know these were animals, and so she would factor that into uh, certain aspects of the world and characters, how they worked, their motivation. So, uh, like like a predatory animal, obviously, is going to be at its sharpest when it's hunting. So the rabbit's blood is basically going to lock Bill into that set. It's going to give him that like hyper focus, almost like a flow state. That's and, a really uh, good explanation. Oh, I am impressed. But, but what pisses Lagoshi off the most, the fact it's not blood, it's the fact that it's rabbit blood. Specifically rabbit's blood. And Lagoshi, you know, again with the animal thing, picked up on it because he's got a canine's nose. He's like a, he's like a goddamn bloodhound throughout this whole series. <laughs> And the fact of what happened at the towards the beginning of the series when he grabbed Haru and that scent of a rabbit. Mm-hmm. He knows exactly what rabbit's blood smells like. So if people haven't read or watched uh, Beastars, what happened was Lagoshi is a gray wolf and Bill is a tiger. They are part of a drama club and Bill finally has the lead role in the play and he is nervous. So... He has a vial of rabbit's blood um, for dope to get him ready for the play because he's nervous. It's his first lead role and he wants to be the best. He wants to showcase he is the best animal, the best carnivore, you know, the top animal of the kingdom. He shouldn't be a beast star. Yeah. <laughs> well, he wants to sh- specifically, he wants to shine as a carnivore. Mm. Right. Not just I'm- Not just as a good animal, but as like to proudly be what he is and have I'm- everyone accept that it's awesome. And the fact that the current lead B star is going to be a herbivore, which mm-hmm. he's not too thrilled about. Mm-hmm. And so they go onto the play. Lagoshi is a stand in villain. And so this gives Lagoshi an opportunity to fight Bill. And Bill has been provoking Lagoshi before this. So it was a build up to this fight scene. Their fight happens on stage in front of the whole school. Mm-hmm. And, you know, as w- when I said, uh, Lagoshi was giving Pauls. Yeah. And well, to be fair, uh, while Bill was provoking Lagoshi, it wasn't quite to the same of let's have like a real ass fight so much as they're, they're both carnivores and uh, both like apex predators in their own right. So I guess what he wanted to do is he wanted Lagoshi to kind of like go all out in the role so he in turn could cut loose as well. Basically, from from like a like a predatory standpoint, they just wanted to have fun, like the way um, like big cats, specifically when they're cubs, when they're playing and they're like biting and scratching the shit out of each other to some capacity, maybe like actually hitting each other would just seem like a good time for Bill. However, uh, he was not expecting them pause the way yeah. Lugoshi was handing them out because he was legit mad. Oh, Lugoshi <laughs> wanted to fuck him up. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but that's the main thing, though. I reckon if it wasn't specifically rabbit blood, Lugoshi would have said something and left it at that. Mm-hmm. But because him catching those feels, oh, and he, he caught them he, hard. He wanted to make an example of Bill. You know, the anime did really good portraying that because in the manga, because we've just seen it in 2D, well, 2D, flat pictures, we just see the fighting scene. But in the anime, we hear the music, we hear Lagoshi's thoughts, the way he's thinking, his emotions through his words. Because when we're reading the manga, we're imagining how he sounds. But in the anime, the voice actors did so well in portraying that was it called desperation mm-hmm. that feel- despair that conflict it's like wow i think what specifically helped this as well with it being a 3d anime which I, i'm not a huge fan of 3d anime is they were able to get certain more nuances in like facial expressions like you'd see be able to see Lugosi's lip curl Mm-hmm. And his eyes sharpen a lot more than you'd be able to get in a necessarily 2D style. Mm-hmm. And the motion of the fighting and how brutal the sound direction was. Like you could hear each Ooh. hit. 
Yeah, like the the real brutality is once Bill got a hold of him. Oh yeah, like that uh, scene was one of the best moments in that first season. Mm-hmm. And it showed everything. And then for Lugosi just to go at it, originally being a stagehand, not even being in the acting side, just like I- I'm just gonna work the lights. Yeah. I'm just happy to help out. I'm just I'm just glad to be here. Yeah. Oh oh look, is that a spider over there? I'm gonna go and play with that. That's that's my new friend. His name's Spidey. <laughs> the way Lugosi is, how passive you see him throughout the most of the sh- show to that mm-hmm. moment is a huge change in character. <laughs> from the time when you first see him interact with Haru. Yeah, he goes she- from being afraid of his own shadow. To like bang for someone's blood. Lagoshi, <laughs> when I first saw him, I was thinking he is the epitome of a teenage boy. He literally looked like one of those teenagers who suddenly had a growth spurt and they mm-hmm. didn't know how to stand. They like he was hunched a lot and he was that lanky, kind of awkward. He was quiet, so people took that that he was socially awkward or I could empathize with this because he was quiet and he looked scary. People thought that he was a scary predator. I Mm -hmm. empathize with that. I'm like, I know what that's like when you're quiet and people misinterpret you. They misunderstand you. And that first scene. What, they think Sugar Dino is a scary predator? (laughs) See, 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 that's the thing. They miss Sugar and Dino and just see Roar. (laughs) (laughs) If people don't know what we're talking about, I have a handle name on Xbox, which is Sugar Dino Roar. I wanted oh, to. She dunks her Xbox. I wanted a kind of tough name, but I wanted to have a dash of cuteness to it. Also, I was watching a lot of My Little Pony at that time. It influenced my name, <laughs> my handle <laughs> name. <laughs> but besides that, so with. Beastars, Lagoshi. He was misunderstood mostly because he was quiet. But when you, that first episode, that first episode is perfect for how he was misunderstood. You guys remember that first episode? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So the scene where they show, oh, what, what, what animal was she? Ellis? Elise? Uh, like a, was she like a llama? Or she was a llama? Uh, no, Tem was the, well, Tem was an alpaca and I think she was an angora goat. That, okay, that yeah, goat. Okay, she was, she was a goat, and they were talking about how Tim, the alpaca, died. He was, what's the term called? Pre- devoured. Yeah, it was <laughs> dev- devoured, mutilated, oh. eaten. He yeah. was devoured by a carnivore, which is taboo in this society. But that's just, in fact, that's a huge difference compared to the manga and the anime. If you look at the first few panels in the manga, it shows you Lugosi's silhouette. It looks distinctively more like a wolf but in the in, uh, manga, whereas there it's it's a lot more obscured in the Yeah, anime. it's more ambiguous in the anime. Right, so they had that scene where they just showed his paw, claw, sliding on the brick wall, making it so menacing. But in actuality, it was just him brushing his hand against the wall. But mm. the way they portrayed that, <laughs> it's like yeah, he's always like imp- like creating this imposing shadow, specifically throughout the like throughout the show in general. But that first episode in particular, he's always kind of like off to the side, just looking intently, and oh. it's kind of playing on the, this idea that you you don't know what he's thinking about. Unintentionally seems way too intense. They do portray him as being the potential killer. And one of the ways to try and make that seem more obvious is when he retrieves that thing from Tem's locker. It's like, oh well, he owed me a book. I just remembered it. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah, because because he he is hiding something, but without knowing what he's hiding, it seems infinitely more suspicious. And right? how they portray the, in fact, isn't that different? How they portray the scene of him approaching Ellis, to I think, and her. where he approaches her, I think, is different. And then you get to see how Lugosi actually is like, no, it's a love letter. I wanted to complete his unfinished business. Yeah. And from her going to be incredibly scared 
to being, oh, I, I never knew. And her mm -hmm. saying to him, oh, I'll tell everyone it was a mistake and everything like that. And she, he's like, no, I don't want everyone to know that this is how Tem managed to reach out to his first love. I don't want that to be what he's remembered for. Mm -hmm. Just keep it between us. And then he goes off and does his own thing. And he's like, oh, he's a good guy. Mm -hmm. yeah. He's a super good guy. What else about Lagoshi fascinates you guys? He was deeply relatable for me. Um, it, he also sounds monotone. That, that's that's just coincidence. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, just just the um, he kind of communicates, and I think there's there's a universal quality to this too, though it's it's depicted in specifically male light. The frustrations you have to deal with having to monitor your every movement, having to specifically make efforts to maintain a certain type of appearance for fear of how other people would react, how it can, it can really create reclusive tendencies and you end up spending more time in your own head than with other people. Mm -hmm. No, I completely understand that. You, you try and overread a situation and by overreading it, you're making the situation worse. Mm -hmm. analyzing every little thing and trying to make sure you can control every little nuance as to not offend people mm -hmm. draws attention to you as you can see what why are they acting like that what they're hiding mm -hmm. which is what everyone asks Lugosi a lot of the time like when he stops the mongoose from trying to attack Louis mm -hmm. and he's like wait you're a carnivore why are you protecting him and he's also like, I just don't want to see anyone get hurt Mm -hmm. Or uh, the uh, scene in the uh, lunchroom is another one. Yeah, where he's going to literally take a dive <laughs> just so he can stop the situation escalating. And Louis is the one to pull him out on it, who solves it. He's like, look, why are you even acting that passive? Yeah, it, I know what you're going to do. Yeah, it's seriously setting Louis off. Like every time he does it, Louis just gets mad. Because he's expecting a carnivore to act like a carnivore. Mm -hmm. Because his backstory, he knows the dark nature of carnivores and how bad that side can be. Yeah, he's seen them at. He's seen carnivores at their absolute worst, and he's expecting them to all be at their absolute worst. Mm -hmm. But Lugosi's breaking that mold, and it's irritating him. Yeah, putting him at like a, like a deep sense of unease, which is like, and there's an interesting give and take to that, considering uh, after the fight between Lugosi and Bill, where on the one hand, he seems to have a bit more respect, open respect for Bill. He also says, I, I never expected you to have any real morality, unlike Lugosi. Kind of, I forgot about that, though. He's like, yeah, I didn't expect any better of you. <laughs> mm -hmm. I, know what you're, I know what you're like. <laughs> So let's give a backstory on Louis. We, we talked about Louis a lot. We talked about how he has a backstory. He knows what it's like about carnivores. Why? What's his story? Well, Louis was a... Re no, well, the first time you notice anything about it is a tattoo on the bottom of his foot. A tattoo and, of a number four. And it, it turns out that's his product number. Louis was bred for food. He was he, literally cattle. He, you first find out about his story that he was going to be served to a carnival, and he has a bit of fight in him. Oh, and I forgot the father's name. I can't, I can't remember. It's and, a short name, that's why. It's really yeah. short. It's like he, on or something. And he notices Lewin is like, I'll take that one. Oh, about paying for him, the carnivores at the black market seem kind of suspect about it. And he's like, oh, no, well, I'm taking it. And then when leaving in the elevator, stops at a level and gives young Louis a knife and puts him in a room of carnivores to see what he's going to do. Mm -hmm. And it shows that Louis would rather take his own life than ha be killed for food. Yeah, it spoke to both. Uh, he had fight in him when he, pulled, when he got pulled out of the cage. And then there was this like element of extreme pride when he got put in the room with those carnivores. So yeah, the um, I was just calling him the stag in my mind. Um, 
Yeah, basically, basically said, okay, you might be strong enough to take over for me since I can't have uh, kids of my own. Mm. And he says, from this point forward, you'll, you're my biological son. Mm-hmm. And that moment, you get to see why Louis has his prejudice against carnivores and this pompous nature of him. You, until later on in the manga and you get to read more, but we're just covering the first season stuff, it, you can't tell if it's a front or just how he is now. Like, yeah, I'm better than these. I know what I can do. I know the worst of this society. I'm going to be better than that. Or if he's just hiding behind that. Mm-hmm. You can't tell if it's his actual nature or just putting on a mask. Mm-hmm. And that's what I like about Louis. He's more complex than he lets off. Like, first time you see him, he's an arrogant shit. Yep. Getting pampered mm-hmm. on. And then when you get through further in the season and you get to see how his relationship develops with Lagosi and get to find out how he is with Haru and the rest of the drama club. And the end of the season, which is an amazing scene. Mm-hmm. He, Louis changes. Well, he doesn't so much change who he is. He's still the same, but your perspective of him changes because you get to see all the situations behind him. Mm-hmm. And I know with Haru, Lahua, you did not like Haru at the start. Nope, I did not. I did not like her at the start. Uh, that's because. When we first see Haru, she's in that, I want to say, cliche scene where she's being bullied by the other girls. And the story behind that is the the leader of the girls, she was also, well, Haru is a dwarf rabbit. The leader uh, of the girls was also a rabbit. Um, a Holocaust rabbit. Which is an endangered species. And apparently, Haru hooked up with the endangered species rabbit's boyfriend so Haru was being picked on by them and it kind of looked like Haru was the victim actually she was the victim she was the victim and it seemed unjustified but later on when you see the male rabbit the one that she hooked up with so in the beginning I'm thinking oh it's a misunderstanding Haru did not do anything with this guy they just kissed because that's what Haru said they just kissed but then you learn that they actually did hook up I was like what a hoe I was like no you deserve that treatment girl that's what you get well there's there's some there's some things that have to be cleared up before you can rule it completely specifically a did Haru know he had a girlfriend yes <laughs> <laughs> and then what made it worse was when Legoshi was on the roof in the garden with her trying to get the roses and they're in the garden shack and Haru misinterpreted, misunderstood Legoshi and she just went at him, started to like unbutton his pants and touch him. I was thinking, you ho. <laughs> well, that scene, <laughs> you also learn two things of Haru expects males to only approach her for one thing. The only exception to that is Louis. Mm -hmm. And you get to find out why Haru is the way Haru is, which is kind of a heartbreaking story in its own right. And And after I learned her story, I felt bad. I was like, oh, I'm so sorry I called you a hoe. There's a reason why you act like this. And you also get to see how Lakosi is the first time he interacts with Haru. <laughs> and he a huge <laughs> blubbering nervous wreck. He was scared for real. <laughs> and when they explain Haru's story, that was that was really interesting because Haru is a dwarf rabbit. She is a really small herbivore. And even her parents told her that they are the weakest herbivore. So if anything happens, they are the first to go, a.k.a. eaten. Mm-hmm. So Haru, when she was younger, when everyone's like the same size as her, she's like, oh, I don't understand. But as she got older, people got bigger than her. They started looking down on her, not looking down on her like they think she's inferior, but literally look down because she's so small. And when she's looking up, she's noticing their little facial expressions. And the biggest thing that she noticed is they're smiling. And she's like, why are you smiling? And She has to analyze why they're smiling. And there's like two things. One, they feel bad for her. And two, they think she looks cute and they can't help but smile. And she got irritated with that because to her, she's like, no, I am not 
a week herbivore. I am me. And she started developing like a complex over that. Then one day, this one guy shows interest in her romantically and sexually. And she has experienced someone who wants her for her, for her body. And is meeting her as an equal rather than yeah. as this thing from on high coming down yes. to, to save her. She realizes the fact that instead of just being someone looking out for her, it's just two people having sex. There's no superiority or inferiority on that. That's the only time she ever feels at the equal footing with someone else. And because of that, that's how she views anyone who approaches her. Well, I, I can be equal with them. But when it comes to Lugosi and I mean, oh, this is my first carnivore. I'm kind of excited. He just like, fuck this shit out. <laughs> yeah, he curved that situation real quick. Which piques Haru's interest as he's the first male to really turn her down. And he really was there just for flowers. Well, no, he was also deeply uneasy due to what went on between the two of them in episode two. Oh yeah, the way yeah, nearly, to, yeah, <laughs> nearly devouring her with sex and I'm gonna say instinct, bloodlust, sex and bloodlust. What I noticed in this story is they are layering that. It's like what they're feeling for sexual activities and for that desire to eat meat mm -hmm. is coming from the same part of their brain like the way they're reacting is very similar and you know that scene at the end with the lion the leader of that gang oh the yeah, the the shishigumi the yeah. lion group and that scene it could it if you didn't know what was going on it looked like the lion was going to rape her mm -hmm. or force himself on her but in actuality he was getting high on that on that event that he's going to eat her not well, getting it, it was also implied her. by saying he'd defile her right right mm -hmm. so guarantee they did that on purpose oh yeah, yeah they wanted to change it like as we'd see that sort of situation in the human world and everything like that in that when you say you're going to defile someone it would necessarily be on the sexual connotation. But when it comes to B stars, and you have to remember, yeah, these are also animals. These also eat each other. The defiling nature and how the scene plays out can be taken in one of two ways. And they play on that. Like they are using the social norms of our world mm -hmm. and adapting it to the B stars world, but also adding the animalistic nature of it as well. So it complicates things and makes a scene how you'd see play out in something else completely different because yeah. at the end of the day, it is animals. That part really reminded me of the show Criminal Criminal Minds where they're, oh, Jesus, that show. Oh. Where, where they're profiling murderers. And a lot of times when they're profiling them, they're figuring out what act is giving them sexual gratification. What act of the killing Mm -hmm. is satisfying that and with b stars it's like they're bringing that in the story too that part of eating mm -hmm. carnivores eating herbivores that appeases that sexual gratification and that can also relate to lagoshi with his does he love haru the rabbit or does he want to eat her well, that's yeah. why he's giving the rabbit pornography. <laughs> <laughs> Explain that. Well, <laughs> oh, we got to talk about my boy. I, well, I keep like he's got referring to him as the panda. What's his name again? Go him. Go him. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, he wouldn't like you calling him the panda. I think he would. <laughs> because well, he, well, he gets mad at Lagoshi for not remembering his name. Well, I don't know his name, and I, I don't really want to drink bamboo tea with him either. But <laughs> going is a her well actually he's an omnivore. Yep. The way they describe the panda species and is the way it is over here. They are primarily carnivores that have adapted to be able to survive on bamboo. And he has the strength 
of a carnivore, but he's on a herbivore diet, and he is the patroller, the doctor, and the police of the black market. He's the one who will take someone in and rehabilitate them. And when he first meets Lugosi, it's on a field trip with Bill and a eagle, or is he a hawk? Um, I want to say a hawk. I'm not sure. Well, and they go to the black market for the first time, and the sights and the smells overtake them. And there's a beggar there who entices them to come over and lifts up his fingers, and you notice some are missing, and each one of them have a price around them. And that's how they peg in the around the black market. They are literally giving up a digit for money. And Bill's all for the idea. Yeah, he's all about embracing his 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 nature. Oh even, no, he was, even he the was, darkest parts of it. He was jumping on that opportunity to finally eat meat. That's what it was. Yeah, there was one thing I appreciated comparing the anime to the manga is that there's a bit more to that scene in the anime. The anime is able to portray more of it mm-hmm. the way it is, and it's able to get into more the mental, well, the mental and the physical reactions because the manga is a very simplistic art style. Mm-hmm. And it is great for it. The manga is really good, and I highly recommend everyone read it. And also, if you've got the chance and you've got Netflix, watch the anime. The anime is fantastic. Mm-hmm. So bored, though, but I personally prefer the dub on this one. But well, the way they show it and the way I've, I've, I've just said his name and I forgot it already. The Panda. <laughs> <laughs> the way he is and meets Lugosi, Lugosi is literally going through a overload of his, the senses are taking over him and he, he can't compose himself. He's literally thrown there, uh, salivating uncontrollably. He can't compose himself and the urge to hunt and kill is coming out of him. And Goheen's like, <laughs> I'm taking you with me. It's like, okay, <laughs> let me deal with this right now. And it cuts to the ghost be being muzzled and chained to a wall with this huge intimidating figure just looking at him and taking pictures of him. Yeah, that, that was, was that creepy. was getting yeah, I was about to say that was getting pretty unsettling. And then you find out why though, is like I I seen this, I've dealt with this, I know people, you've eaten meat. And Logosi hasn't. He's just had the animalistic nature of wanting to kill Haru mm-hmm. at this point. And the way it continues is it gets to the point where Goheen and Logosi are talking and Goheen go- is trying to figure out from Logosi, do you actually love the rabbit or do you just want to kill it? Are you mistaken lust with murder? Mm-hmm. Do you want to is, eat this is meat? Your, like is the uh, predatory part of your brain playing, playing a trick on you? Mm. making you think you love her so you'll get close to her and then yeah and the way he tries to get this out of him is here take this with you and if he doesn't turn you on stay away from her and he's giving him a rabbit pornography (laughs) it's like i suppose the possibility exists you might have a rabbit fetish in which (laughs) case you're okay yeah i was not expecting that i was like oh Okay, this is realistic, though. Um, <laughs> we we got to find out, boy. We got to find out if you really like want her in bed or in your mouth. Um, <laughs> well, if you got that one timid in bed and one into the mouth, if you go towards, <laughs> is it the last, last, no, the, is it the last episode or the penultimate? Um, I think it's like episode 11 or 12. <laughs> Where they do actually end up in bed. Yeah, and kind of both happen. Because <laughs> yeah, his nature is, I want to eat you, and her nature is, I want to be in your mouth. <laughs> well, can we talk about that? Can we talk about how Haru instinctively put her arm in his mouth? Can we talk about that? Like she was I'm... literally trying to jump into it. Yeah. He's like, I'm sorry, it's my herbivore instincts. I'm like, girl, aren't you trying to make something work with him? Well, she had a moment like that earlier in the series where they were trying to eat dinner. Oh, and, and she's eating he, and her legs like, I need to run. I need to get yeah, out of here. Her legs would kick any time he opened his mouth. It was constantly that. And the only reason that changed was when they were walking back to her dorm, he tied a shoe for him. Mm-hmm. And she's like, wait, this guy's actually a really nice guy. And up until this point, Haru's not said her name to Lugosi. 
because mm-hmm. she just wants to be like, okay, this is a one and done. After this, it's a thank you, and I'm never going to see him again because mm-hmm. he scares the shit out of me. Yeah. And then she sees the tender side of Lugosi, which only Jack has really seen. And Jack's mm-hmm. his best friend who was a Labrador. It, only Jack's ever seen this side of Lugosi, and it's someone else seeing it and seeing, yeah, this is a genuinely nice guy. And her feelings of friendship at this point towards him start overcoming her herbivore nature of, I need to get away from this guy. Yeah, well, it's like her the logical part of her brain and the animal part of her brain are sort of at odds where Lagoshi is concerned, where it seems to almost be going in the opposite direction for Lagoshi, where his um, what's attracting him to Haru is the animal part. What do you think um, made him think towards the end that it's not the animal part? What he was able that... to go through to actually save her. Oh, yeah, it was the it was going through that that made him um, sincerely appreciate being a wolf. Like, uh, mm. there's a couple of scenes like that with different characters where, where I know at least with Bill, there's a moment where he, he says, like, you know, I'm, I'm glad I was born a tiger. And I want to say there's at least one other character who says that they were happy that they were they were having a moment where they were happy they were born as what they are. The opposite end being um, Lagoshi kind of like es- expressing some lament about being a predator. Like something that's like maybe like a through line across the board is um, these animal characters wanting to be at peace with what they are. And for whatever reason, for various reasons, not being able to find that due to the machinations of society. So do you think it's because Lagoshi has organized his thoughts, his instincts, his desires, that he knows what exactly he's feeling. He doesn't. That's the thing. Because mm-hmm. even when he's going to save Haru from the Shishigumi, even, I, I don't know if I can say it verbatim, but the context is, even comes out with, that's my prey. He said, yeah, he says, uh, Haru's mine. She's my prey. And, and he's like, what the fuck? What did I just say? Yeah, he, he knows that he wants her. And even up to the point where they try and have sex, mm-hmm. he's still not sure, is is it love? Or does he just want to devour her? That doesn't change until the very last scene in Beastars where he finally manages to compose himself and say, no, this is it, this is it, I do love this rabbit. Mm-hmm. And Haru is even trying to escape that because she doesn't want... She reciprocates the feelings, but she doesn't want to. Mm-hmm. And it's just the way everything turns out. And like, and if we're talking about the Shishigumi, Louis has the best redemption part in that entire series. Can we talk about that part? Let's oh, talk well, about that. When Louis goes, well, when Haru gets kidnapped, the mayor wants to sweep it all under the rug. And this is where you find out he's had his fangs removed because he wants to be more approachable mm-hmm. to herbivores and be like, look, I'm removing my carnivore side and I'm protecting everyone. Yeah, and he's to great pains to cast a good image for lions in the media. So finding out that the lion group is going to kidnap and eat a high school girl is going to screw everything up. And with Louis being the potential B star, he's asking Louis keep sweep this all on the rug, keep it between us. Keep, only the people who know need to know have have to know know, and you're going to keep on track. And the way it looks like Louis is going to go up with this and like, yeah, even with the Lugosi, he's like, it's not my fault. It's not my problem. And Lugosi goes through his all, I'm going to save the girl and goes off with her. And then at the end, you find out Lugosi hasn't killed the boss of the Shishigumi. He just severely injured him. And then you see Louis coming with a gun. Packing heat. <laughs> <laughs> Shoves the gun in the boss's mouth and pulls the trigger. Blows his brain out everywhere. Then you have the other members come in. And look, I am number four. <laughs> and seeing how good he tastes and everything like that. And puts the gun to himself. And then you hear a gunshot. It doesn't show what happens. Mm-hmm. It just cuts away and it's left ambiguous. But read the manga. And how it all is, Louis has a great redemption arc. And you're like, holy shit. He's actually been working this from behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. Well, there's some bits in the dialogue between uh, him and Lagoshi 
uh, before Lagoshi takes off to save Haru that seem to indicate that he he really does want Lagoshi to go out and save her, basically in his stead. Uh, but it never implies that Lou himself is going to do anything yeah. towards the prospect of even trying. It mm-hmm. didn't. And then to see him there with a gun. <laughs> mm-hmm. Which is a much bigger shock in the anime because there's a scene in the manga they take out where you first see Louis with the gun and he's pulling it on Bill. Oh, that's right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, specifically. Well, yeah, actually, I'm not sure if I can really say anymore because I don't know if they're going to go into those details in the next season or not. Say it. Say it. Um, potential. You can say it. We're just not going to discuss it, and you can have your theories. Like me and okay. <laughs> me and Lua know what's going to happen. We're caught up, mm-hmm. but you can always say your theories on what you think is going to happen. Well, no. What I'm saying is, is I don't know if they're going to recount that scene in the in a future season of the anime as like a flashback or something. Oh, if he's going with the anime, um, it's a potential if they dive more into what happened during the first mm-hmm. season, mm-hmm. or have a clip a clip type show which shows you what sort of things could have went on behind the scenes like for everything that the show i'd say was it 47 chapters is how many is the anime yes there's a good Mm -hmm. like five or six chapters worth of material in total that's not in there Mm -hmm. mainly for pacing issues and i can understand why they change certain things but when it comes to stuff like with louis and the shishigumi i'm kind of glad that was kept out the anime uh, because mm-hmm. but that moment was such a shock and to see Louis going from this more of a timid, pompous person, and then all of a sudden, holy shit, this guy's a badass. Yeah, yeah, this like high society, almost like foppish <laughs> dude trying to maintain this tough image to n- no, he he's packing heat and he's seen some shit. <laughs> And he's willingly going to be devoured. Which is rare for an herbivore to do. Well, the only other herbivore, well, if you want to call him a herbivore that shows anything like that, is going. Yeah. Well, there's there's like the societal, like we've talked a lot about the societal image of the carnivore uh, and how it's not as hard-coded or as openly embraced to a fault. Uh, you know, by by those by the carnivores in that world. There's also the social status of the herbivore as kind of being the being intelligent and logical, but also sort of like weak and defenseless, and maintaining this sort of like moral high ground through that end, which to some degree, I think to some degree, Louis kind of despises. Like, I think he seems to like the idea of being seen as, like, intelligent and peaceful and logical, but not, like, weak and helpless. No, because when you're seeing weak and helpless, uh, you can be seen as someone that can be taken advantage of. Mm -hmm. And he worked so hard to be strong, to survive. I think he would feel that that's an insult, Mm -hmm. that he's being looked down on, that he's being looked down as a prey. Yeah. And I think that's why he reacted so strongly to Bill mm-hmm. um, with the gunpoint. He's like, oh, no, mofo. Mm-mm. I got oh, a gun. Yeah. You got your claws? I got this gun. <laughs> yeah, equal my ass. <laughs> so, <laughs> since that scene isn't in the anime, the only one, one I think that I could compare that where he shows that towards Bill is during the stage play of Adler. Mm-hmm. Well, Lugosi and Bill are fighting, and then Louis, even having a broken leg, still manages to come back on stage and be like, aha, no, I am the true Adley, you're the fake one, and reminds Bill, remember, this is my stage. <laughs> <laughs> like, fuck your striped ass out of here. <laughs> <laughs> that, and when it comes to the telling them off and saying, look, you're both suspended, you can't do this, and everything like that, and then turning out this stage play was a success because of the changes and how realistic the fighting looked. It's like, oh yeah, it was all a work. You got yeah, raw energy came just, through. Yeah, we decided to change it to uh, sh- for the new students and that. And then Louis like, don't say a fucking word. <laughs> like, Louis goes, she's off to the side, like, bitch, I saw you smiling. <laughs> <laughs> 
So the part where Louis was taken in when he was, quote, adopted, quote, mm-hmm. I found that interesting because it reminded me of natural selection. And if people don't know what natural selection is, it's when a animal, a, a species, because of what characteristic they have, it helps them survive and produce offspring. And their offspring mm-hmm. take on that characteristic that made the previous generation stronger and survive and to that end weeds out the characteristics that make something weaker or easier to be killed right so with louis dad he couldn't have kids but he wanted an offspring he wanted a child that was strong that could carry on what he built i'm not too sure what louis dad does but i'm assuming he's a powerful man And he wants to create a legacy. So he adopts Louis. And he needed someone who was strong, who had specifically a strong mentality. Because I remember what his dad said. His dad says, like, you are going to be a leader for the herbivores. We need someone strong. So it made me think, okay, is there a flaw in the herbivores where he thinks that they need to be stronger? Well, it's it's probably just more the uh, societal image mm-hmm. of the herbivore as weak as uh, prey animals. Um, it's interesting that they had, you know, his uh, father, the person who's supposed to be this huge presence, be a stag because they kind of invoke that visually speaking. Yeah. And even though they are herbivores, they are technically prey animals. They have like literal weapons on their heads. <laughs> <laughs> so there, there is an elo. There, there is an apparent element of danger to them. So it, it's kind of, I think it, it's a good pick for the herbivore that projects strength. And it usually portrays deers as being graceful. Mm-hmm. And making him the a graceful animal, the head of the drama club. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And walking high and mighty. Mm-hmm. That was, it, that's kind of like in Bambi, where you see Bambi's father. I yeah. was just thinking about that. <laughs> I would say when it shows that nature of like Bambi's dad, how he's the protector of the forest, and how he that is portrayed, and then you see Louis, this graceful creature, and high and mighty, and stands above all, and you think, yeah, you're a bit of a. I'm not saying well, that <laughs> but, <laughs> it's okay. I felt it. Yeah, you felt it. But <laughs> Louis like that. But then you see the back story and see the other nature, and you're understanding. Yeah, I'm, you get a pass. <laughs> well, the reason why I was questioning about the herbivores, like if there's a flaw, because I'm like wondering, is this a foreshadow of what's going to happen after high school? Like, yeah, we're seeing what's happening in high school, but is there going to be something, is something going to happen in, like, politically outside of the high school? Um, That's what I was wondering. I don't think it is, because it does show you even outside of high school, you still have the herbivores and carnivores working together. There's still this kind of segregation that the high school has with the herbivore and carnivore dorms, but it's Mm -hmm. kept under control by the black market and everyone is working towards the black market like it says the funeral homes the morgues the hospitals all donating bodies to black market and a lot of the times they do have it's like where you find out like farmers where's my meat come from and you get to see the origin of the meat a lot of the yeah a lot of the places in the black market have origin so you can understand like no, this animal wasn't kidnapped and bred for me. It's come from this place and everything like that. It wasn't killed specifically for me. Mm -hmm. A lot of places in the black market do seem to operate under that. But then you also see the other side of the black market where they do raise herbivores as cattle, Mm -hmm. which is the black, black market, it seems. (laughs) The double black market. The, The deep down, dark, deep market. But it shows you that there are some herbivores and carnivores that are working towards a brighter future but it seems like the black market can't be sustained through the more humane means i would say humane 
Oh, so so like the the stuff they get from the hospitals, the funeral homes, and all that is not going to be enough to sustain it. No. Yeah, it doesn't seem that way, especially the fact that they've got to have. Well, you know, you also through the uh, the leader of the Shishigumi find out you got people who like like to think of themselves as like gourmets or some shit, <laughs> and specifically want want something live. That just remind, when you call them a gourmet, just reminded me of Skiyama from Tokyo Ghoul. Oh Jesus! I haven't seen Tokyo Ghoul yet, but I, I guess that gives me something to look forward to. <laughs> Skiyama is one of the best characters in Tokyo Ghoul. He, he is the gourmet. He's literally called the gourmet. Oh dear! Uh, I want to eat you while you're eating her. <laughs> Yikes! That, yeah, that is one of the scenes from that book. That's why Gourmet made me think of that. Watch Tokyo Ghoul, but when it, but yeah, you do have that sort of thing where they do need to provide meat for the black market, and I'd, and maybe the dead meat won't last as long as freshly killed. Like mm-hmm. something that's already dead may come necrotic very quickly. Yeah, it's also probably not going to like satisfy those urges if that's what people are getting the meat for. That's why you do with like the rabbit blood in the vial. Mm-hmm. The rabbit willingly gave that blood. So it seems like a way of subsidizing income. Mm-hmm. People to sell blood. Because you do see that in a scene where the chicken who lays the eggs. Mm-hmm. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Unfertilized egg. <laughs> Well, yeah, unfer- unfertilized eggs. But the change of the day. <laughs> She's so upset that the ghost didn't have an egg sandwich. So like, yeah, the sandwiches aren't that good. My life is over. <laughs> <laughs> like, certain animals are able to subsidize their income, like the chickens were able to lay eggs, and one was obsessed with having the perfect eggs. Mm-hmm. Well, there are ways of making money in the world of B stars that are both ethical and unethical. Yeah, like selling your fur. Or you can rip out someone's canines and sell that. I'm not exactly sure who's going to buy it, but... Well, the Shishigumi did want to skin Lagosa. Well, no, it wasn't yeah. the Shishigumi. It was those... Oh, yeah, those goons. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, they were going to skin them. Well, I mean, they were going to skin them, but also the uh, everyone in, that, in the uh, dog dorm... Uh, trim themselves for the summer and they said they were talking about making money off the fur Mm -hmm. and that uh fingerless guy was like grabbing lugosi's teeth and saying his canines would sell for a good price that that fingerless guy was weird lord was he like like what the f got into him like he looked all the way screwed up that was a super creepy scary and I don't know. It triggered something in me when I saw that scene. I was disturbed. I felt sympathy. I felt disgust. Mm-hmm. I felt, I think I felt that's kind of how stuff. the anime portrayed the black market and the psychological effect on younger carnivores better than the manga. Mm-hmm. That the visual aid and the actual motion and see, hearing voices mm-hmm. and seeing how they portrayed it did help more than the manga in that scene. Yeah, it was um, it really the anime kind of gave that scene a really nightmarish quality. But in the manga, when you see the black market more, I feel like I got desensitized. It mm. didn't seem as bad. And like you guys said before, it, the black market is an area where they sell meat that's actually needed in their society because it helps appease. It helps the carnivores so they don't have bloodlust uncontrollably mm-hmm. because they have something that can satisfy that. There is a secret, what quote, secret, quote, an area where they can hide from society and eat the meat. It's a it's an open secret. <laughs> there you go. Open mm-hmm. secret. And if they go against it, they have to answer to Panda Man. See, that's <laughs> yeah. the thing I'm, um, I'm wondering about Panda Man. So Panda Man, go in. <laughs> <laughs> go ahead. He one so, eyes over here like that's my boy. Badass panda. <laughs> go ahead. Don't be mad at you, spirit. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just about to do that scene from Godfather. Every time we call him the panda, you're like, look how they massacred my boy. <laughs> <laughs> so him, he is like the enforcer slash therapist for carnivores who get out of control with yeah. their desire for meat. He usually goes after those 
who killed someone didn't get meat from the market but killed someone mm. they lost control of their instincts and desires and they killed someone and instead of turning them in to the police where they pay for that crime he instead treats them mm -hmm. helps them mentally that way they don't repeat the uh, the offense again it's really interesting that he's okay with carnivores eating meat mm -hmm. because he understands that that's who they are he doesn't blame them he doesn't what's that word where you're angry at them you blame them uh i'm having a brain fart he doesn't seem to begrudge them their nature. Right, but, begrudge. There you go. <laughs> but he also begrudge. seems to look down on them to some degree. Right. He doesn't begrudge them, but he because he understands, but he does want them to what's it called? Redeem. Go through redemption mm -hmm. and make an effort to make things right. It, that is so gray. Go in is is a gray area, but I love him. Mm-hmm. Wow, there's other characters who are like black and white. I guess all the characters I like are gray. Legoshi, Louie, Gohin, Kaina Haru. Haru's kind of gray. She's kind of. She's not there yet. She's not gray mm -hmm. yet. <laughs> so what else um, did you guys like about the story? Uh, I feel like one character we haven't really gone in on yet is uh, Juno. Juno! <laughs> The reason I haven't really gone in on Juno is I don't believe she has much of a character until after the first season's worth of manga. Oh, okay. So she's going to get a lot more... Uh, yeah, she's going to get a lot more prominent and everything like that. And since this is specifically about the first season, mm -hmm. I don't really want to spoil it other than the fact that you can tell right now she has a thing for Lugosi. Well, yeah. let's talk about her. Let's talk about her introduction and how how she's seen. You first see her where she's getting ostracized for being a wolf. Mm -hmm. And Lugosi is going to kind of like, it's not my thing to deal with. But then something makes him step in and he's like, are you okay, sister? <laughs> <laughs> and then you hear the typical anime line of big brother. <laughs> Yeah, it's almost like a parody of what would normally happen in an anime. <laughs> that scene is just like, oh, okay, I, I see what you did there. One eye, I know you like Juno. Why do you like her? Um, she's she's an interesting character in that. Well, one, she kind of like pulls the wool over your eyes because she starts off just being like, seeming like generic, like a generic anime uh, like element to uh, throw a love triangle off, even just slightly. Yeah, but, like she's just going to be there and want for Lagoshi and not get any play and be sad. But then, you know, as it turns out, she's actually got like Fangs. a level of ambition. Oh, yeah. Yeah. She's got some serious teeth figuratively and literally. And, you know, makes that known specifically with uh, Louie and Haru. And specific, I think I think one of the things that's interesting to me is just like her status in the story. She's trying to do for uh, carnivores what Louis might be trying to do for herbivores, which is create a better world, a better like Louis seems to want to create a safer world, and Juno seems to want to create a world where carnivores can both be accepted and have their strengths appreciated. Mm -hmm. She wants carnivores to be appreciated for being carnivores rather than mm -hmm. bending over to... For for adapting like to them. the whims of herbivores. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, but the way she is, you can... Like the scene with Haru where she, Juno confronts Haru. And Haru's like, yeah, me and Lagos, you're super close and everything like that. And she just smells and goes, oh, so you haven't had sex, so there is still a chance. <laughs> 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 Juno gets so much... Like, at the beginning... She becomes across as your typical kind of yandere ish character. Mm -hmm. she, and, she has some yandere ish traits. And there is the sort of like racist nature of the both the carbon of ours and her was like, oh, look, there's Lugosi, there's another gray wolf. You should go for that. It's, yeah. sort of, it's sort of like you have to be with your own species. There's an expectation to further the 
both further the species in and of itself, but to maintain some aspect of purity. I want to say uh, going, it may have just been in the manga, says something about like uh, Lugosi's feelings, amongst other things, being like an adolescent crush, like, you know, having feelings for an animal of another species is fine when you're young and immature. But, you know, when you grow up, you mm. you get with uh, one of your own kind. Well, it does kind of touch that in the anime, but just through the state of calling it a fetish. Mm -hmm. It yeah. doesn't really go into that whole, it's a teenage thing, but it's kind of like, oh, it's just a teenage fetish. Mm -hmm. It glosses over that. And pacing, mainly. Mm -hmm. But the way the anime is paced, it does suit that more. The way it is, it is expected of, yeah, you stick to your own. Mm -hmm. And when you're with your own, you make sure it's of your own kind as well. Yeah. It can't just be a canine. It's got to be the same breed. Which is why everyone's trying to push Juno and Lugosi yeah. together. Oh, oh yeah. She's another gray wolf. So you two are going to get together. Or in, some, in the minds of some people, you already are together. Yeah, it's expected. Yeah. And Juno believes that too. That oh, it's another gray wolf. Like when they're in their oh, what's the hour called? Oh yeah, that um, what is it like territory hour or something like that? Yeah, where they go into a dark room with like a moon and everything like that, and you go yeah, they, everyone goes, all the species go into a room that kind of replicates their habitat, and I it, like it that. just kind of kind of helps them to relax. And it also brings back to the fact of yeah, these are still animals. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like it, it keeps going off its own thing, but there are points every now and again that does remind you it's still an animal yeah like they their their society definitely reflects ours but the animal element is integrated very well and like very deeply into it so no analogy is ever going to be exactly one for one and that kind of well like i was saying before it creates more room for people to relate to the characters mm. And it also helps certain situations be interpreted multiple ways. Mm -hmm. Like Definitely. when we were talking about the whole defiling of Haru. Yep. That can be taken multiple ways because of how this world is set up. Mm -hmm. And it's better for it. You can't go into this expecting the normal social norms, even that other tropes anime have set up. Mm -hmm. Like even if it's a Izakai and you go to another world, there's another rule sets and everything like that. There's still the norm of this is how a human acts towards a human. If a human says this, it's still this. Mm -hmm. But when it becomes to the animalistic nature of Beastars, everything's open up for interpretation. And you see it how you want. And I honestly think that is one of the best parts about Beastars. It's, a lot of it is subjective. Mm -hmm. and, and to that end, it um, plays with the psychology in really interesting ways. But not... But at the same time, it leaves things open so no one really gets kind of like locked out. Like, you're not going to watch B stars and it's like, okay, the protagonist is a male, which means I can't relate to anything that's going on here. Or, you know, Haru's there, but, you know, I, there's nothing I can relate to there. No, you're, I can almost guarantee you, you're going to find something there for you in every character. I relate to Lugosi's love of Beatles. <laughs> <laughs> joking aside the way that Lugosi explains how having Beatley around helps him mm -hmm. it's kind of sad that's how he sees it and that's how it helps him mm -hmm. like yeah this creature I'm bigger than it and it knows I can kill it but knowing that makes me not do it that's a simplification of the term of how it goes but the way Lugosi puts it across it's kind of like yeah knowing that i can kill this creature any moment but i'm not i can be gentle with it well it's it's the reason why some of the like biggest and scariest people can also be the kindest there's um a freedom from insecurity it's also why i think louis is on edge all the time he's far too aware of the fact that so many people around him are capable of hurting him and it's why like Haru's got a huge ass complex. There's a very, very, very small number of people who can't basically kill her on accident, and it's it's the same reasons why like some people will keep weapons on them, or they'll they'll pick up like a martial arts training or try and bulk up. Uh, that feeling Enjoy of security, 
Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> that 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 feeling, the feeling of security you get from having that strength or power, um, can doesn't always, but can open the open the door to you being more peaceful, or rather, being at peace, and to that end, being more peaceful. So we wanted to go back on the topic of Juno. I was wondering about Juno's feelings for Lagoshi. Is it is she attracted to him because out of instinct and is she going after him because people expect her to? Like how you guys think, touch on touch on that both. she's the same species? Mm-hmm. Well, and I think it's we'll- a mixture of both. Because she even says that species of the same kind feel more comfortable around each other. Mm-hmm. But is she convincing herself of that? I think her feelings aren't as strong. Her base feelings aren't as strong as she thinks. Mm. Um, like, like the initial attraction is probably because of what he did and that the basic, the, the gray wolf connection. However, mm. the depth of the infatuation, I think might have more to do with how it benefits her own ambitions. I also see it being the whole first love thing. Oh yeah, yeah. That strong connection, or like the first time you have feelings for someone, how it can feel stronger than it actually is because you've never really experienced that emotion before. Mm-hmm. And I think it's a mixture of all three factors. I think it's the whole Lugosi saving her, standing up for her, and it's a guy standing up for her. The mm-hmm. whole fact that she even mentioned that because they're both grey wolves, they feel more comfortable around each other, and it's the fact that she's caught feels for the first time. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I can see it being a mixture of all three, which is persuading her that way. I wouldn't say it's pushing her. I'd say it's more of a persuasion. Mm-hmm. Like She feels like she has to act on those feelings. Not choosing, not like choose for like choosing, but feeling like she has to act on them. Like mm-hmm. she feels obligated? Kind of. Like she's just going on these feelings. And I think the fact that there'll be peer pressure around her, like, look, you're a gray wolf. He's a gray wolf. And her being like, oh, yeah, it's true. And you have to remember that it's also got the Japanese side of it where it's the upperclassmen mm. and you respect oh, yeah. your elders and, you, like that, and it's, it's her senpai sort of thing. It, it literally senpai noticed me. Yeah, it's, the senpai noticed me sort of thing. When I, you had some thoughts. Um, I think Spirit covered a lot of them uh, with... I guess specifically with Juno and her uh, feelings on Lagoshi. Um, there was a minor thing I wanted to mention that gave me concern. And it's almost a throwaway line. Uh, when the uh, mongoose is talking about how everyone in the drama club has some sort of like weird, either personality quirk or unique history. And he talks about the uh, cheetah who worked as a dominatrix at 14 years old. <laughs> I was thinking about that. The drama club, everyone has a backstory. What did you want to touch on about that? Well, I have some concerns about a 14-year-old girl working as a dominatrix, for one. Well, one thing that, that came off as interesting is that, um, and I don't know if this is like a translation thing, in the manga, uh, I think that the club, the s and club, it's referred to as specifically as a like carnivore s and club. And I'm wondering if they're kind of like, if it being that spe- spe- specified means like there's there's like a group of people that kind of fetishize the terror or the strength of a uh, carnivore. I can't respond to you because something like that comes up later on in the manga. Okay. Well, I'll look forward to that. Well, I want to touch up on that. I want to touch on that. Um well, remember, we, we, one night, we don't want to spoil it a little one night. No, 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 no. Um, it was something I was thinking about. Remember when I said that there's that, that borderline of killing? Mm-hmm. Killing, mm-hmm. Borderline of killing, fulfilling that sexual gratification? Mm-hmm. I saw this in Haru, where when she's with Lagoshi, and she said that she has that instinct to be eaten by him. Oh, the and, way we jump in his mouth. Right. And then there's that scene when they're in the garden shed and she's getting excited that she's going to like hook up with a carnivore. Mm. It, I was thinking, like, is that the thrill of that danger layering with that sexual thrill? I wonder if there's some overlap to it because I remember that bit where Juno's got uh, Louis pinned down. 
he kind of like briefly remark, remarks that, well, one, that he'd rather be devoured by her than than uh, Bill or Lagoshi, but then kind of like remarks, I don't know, maybe jokingly, that being devoured by her might actually be pleasant. I think the way he was talking to her was just t- because of how strong and proud she was acting. Mm-hmm. It's a throw her off a game. Mm. Louis is kind of like that. Mm-hmm. I think that one's, you can interpret it in a in a different way because this is this is a guy who rather kill himself than be eaten before, right? And for mm-hmm. him to say that, it's like I guess it's an honor for someone to have the privilege to eat him. Well, yeah, isn't that also the mentality he has when he's uh, cornered by the 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 lion group? Yeah, and he's, I have number four. My flesh tastes awesome. <laughs> but when he's saying it to her, I think it's kind of like trying to throw her off a game because she's all seems inexperienced when it comes to males Mm -hmm. and he's play playing with that knowledge that yeah i'm gonna say something that's gonna maybe trip you up or you may take it how you want Mm -hmm. but saying it with the intention of just gauging a reaction Mm -hmm. like the whole who knows might be nice by you because mm-hmm. to get a whole what the nanny sort of moment <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you get that big what out of someone that means you have the psychological advantage. Yeah, I think that's what he was going for, to play with him rather than say, let me give you this honor. Mm -hmm. If it was any other character, then I'd think uh, more about it, but it's Louis. That's what makes me lean in that way. Um, Speaking of Legoshi and Louis, so remember in the beginning of the story where Louis talks about if I offered you my leg, um, oh, yeah. you would eat it, right? And then he reveals that he has a number four branded under his foot. I was like, hmm. oh, that was that was a good foreshadow or built up to that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I didn't even think about that till you mentioned it. When I please read the manga. <laughs> no, I'm waiting for the anime. <laughs> yeah, so there's a lot of stuff that was happening in the beginning of the story that foreshadowed what happened later on. Mm-hmm. From the beginning towards the end, you did have kind of a personality switch between Lugosi and Louis. Mm-hmm. Like Louis acting all his pomposity and fearlessness. Yeah, being very aggressive, being very active versus and, assertive. Mm-hmm. And then you have Lugosi being very passive. Mm-hmm. And at the very end, you have before you find out Lugui, Louis Lugui, <laughs> Louis <laughs> is going towards the Shishigumi. <laughs> Stop it! Cut that out. <laughs> no, it's 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 not even that. It's I wonder if that's what people who ship those two together call them. <laughs> Lugui. <laughs> <gasps> okay, because I'm I'm pretty sure I saw multiple Twitter posts reading all kinds of like reading those like intense moments between them as as like sexual the specifically slash moment yeah specifically the bite me scene yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah the whole dynamic shift between the two up until you see louis go against the shishigumi mm-hmm. you see the passive nature of louis towards the end yeah and it is a their whole character arc seems to have done a 180 on both of them yep it's just the whole intriguing nature of how it is and where it's going to go and since they do seem to be a good job keeping relatively close to the manga, mm-hmm. I, I'm looking forward to seeing where it's going to go and if it keeps at the pace it's going, because it's pretty good. Yeah, I'm, I'm hoping the uh, next season comes out sooner rather than later. You know uh, it's at least two years away. <laughs> oh, I'm hoping that. <laughs> so I did watch the anime, both dub and sub, and... I thought they both sounded they both sounded good. Mm-hmm. Like there is no, I want to say there is no dramatic changes in the voices and how the characters were portrayed, which I appreciate. I really appreciate that too. <laughs> I just feel like the way the voices come across in the dub for Lugosi, Louis, and Haru, the inflections on them sound better like i think shonen anime usually comes across better subbed Mm -hmm. because you get how you tend to get it in a subbed anime that way is the speed and the volume and the overacting you normally get oh oh, 
in oh, a no. sub shonen anime. No one overacts better than the Japanese. They let it all out. <laughs> well, <laughs> I, I normally get it in like a shonen, I'd say shonen sub anime. You mm-hmm. normally get the more overacting and the speed and the volume and the weird noises. Mm-hmm. But when it comes to the subtlety of B stars, I'd say it. I, I prefer the English dub for this because of the slight nuances and everything like that. Mm. But I believe for this one, it may be better if they've subbed it in your native, dubbed it in your native language. Mm-hmm. You'd be able to pick up on the contextualizations of certain scenes better. And I think that's why I prefer the dub on this because I can hear the inflections, I can hear the subtleties in the voice changes. You can hear how face the voice changes with the facial animation. And because I'm a native English speaker and I can pick up on these things, I can relate to that more. Mm-hmm. And if there's if you, you speak French or Spanish and if there is that sort of dub, that may be the better way of you watching something like this because then you'll notice all the slight nuances in your language. Because they won't necessarily be the same as my like, English, they won't be the same as Japanese. So watching something like this, where it does rely on a lot of emotion and contextualization, that's kind of what you need. No, I definitely agree. Uh, yeah, especially with B stars. Well, I'd say with anything that's psychological oriented, because this is quite a psychological show. Mm-hmm. It, if, from the manga, how it looks a little bit, and the Anime to a style, it just come across more of a shoujo, mm-hmm. but it's a psychological signing. Yeah, it's it's almost like yeah, it's like in a weird space between um, shoujo and seinen that isn't Jose. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that is the best way to say. It. But yeah, you've got that sort of thing, and when it comes to like the more psychological thing and more nuanced stuff, mm-hmm. if you're familiar with the language. Mm-hmm. That might be better. Is like when you translate Japanese to English, this it's not a one to one, and how certain people would react in certain situations. You wouldn't necessarily get the same answers or the same body language. That's why in this certain situation, when it comes to the it's definitely the subject material, when it comes to the segregation and the racist nature of what you see in this show. If you're familiar with how stuff is being said and how it's portrayed, I'd honestly say if you can watch this dubbed in your native tongue, that would be the best way to go. I did question if if the anime first started in English or in Japanese because a lot of the dialogue and the scenes in the English dub were so natural, worked out so well in mm-hmm. the scenes. Because I've seen some dub where I'm like questioning, like, wait... Is this the literal translation, or did they change it around to make it to make sense? Well, well, I think um, I think the intent with uh, B stars and specifically how the characters were created was for this not to be much like how a lot of the uh, social issues are not like one for one overlay with social issues in the real world. And there's elements that are just truly and completely unique to this world. I think it also applies to, how do I put this? I guess ethnicity, which is to say this is um, like a lot of these names are not Japanese names. Uh, Haru is the only one I can really think of. Um, I feel like the animals on top of just being different species are maybe either can represent different ethnicities or aren't, aren't really meant to be specific it's kind of a multitude because like i say there's a haru Mm -hmm. then you've got legoshi or legosi on how you want to say that which is basically named after bella legosi Mm -hmm. you've got louis which is a french name Mm -hmm. you've got bill which english or american i i I would say if if we're going to give bill an ethnicity he is a american ass american (laughs) he's 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 macho man macho (laughs) man florida man who's proud to be in floridian (laughs) i'm proud to be a cold war yeah he's got that and jack yeah he would say it like that too (laughs) corn of war (laughs) 
you can take your herbivore agenda and get out. <laughs> <laughs> but way it is it is covering a multitude of different ethnicities and everything like that. It's, yeah, it's like a multicultural world. I yeah, it's a multicultural, segregated, ageist, racist, sexist world. So America. Yeah. Well, the panda, he's got the a Chinese sounding name. Yes. Okay. Which Fun I'm, fact. I'm assuming is reflecting the pandaness. Mm-hmm. Fun fact pandas are black, white, and Asian. That went yeah. nowhere. I apologize. <laughs> I'll see myself out. <laughs> Get out of this call. I had to think about that. I was like, wait, he could mean this in different ways. <laughs> Let me think before I react to this. <laughs> But what I'm saying, if you can watch Beastars in your native language, do it because it's it's this is an inclusive one for everyone. Mm-hmm. But make no mistake, this is not for the faint of heart. You can't go in expecting this just to be like your average love story. Yeah, you don't get to just turn your brain off and look. Yeah, you have to pay attention. You have to think. You have to realize what is going on. You got to feel too. Yeah, you're yeah. you're gonna feel. If you, if you don't feel, there's something wrong. <laughs> but <laughs> it's an all inclusive show that I think many people are going to miss out on because of the aesthetics and maybe the mistaking it for a weird fairy love story, <laughs> which is anything but. It's this show tackles some stuff that a lot of other shows or manga would be afraid to touch. Hmm. I will say that the mangaka who's writing this story, she deserves all the credit she gets for what she has made. Mm -hmm. This is an amazing story. It's touched a lot of subjects. Like I said, a lot of other ones would try and steer away from. Like A lot of things don't like touching racism. Mm -hmm. Well, not only that, but also Mm -hmm. like the pervertedness of... Mm -hmm how people can be well yeah there's this very like very freudian aspects to some of the psychology specifically with carnivores the idea that like all that base stuff violence sex all comes from the same place right and you know weird uncomfortable instances of it overlapping yes yes there are a lot of those but it works it works Mm -hmm. because of the setting and the mangaka made it work it wasn't like in your face either. Oh no! It's it set, started off with it being a background thing and something for you to notice. Mm-hmm. But then it started picking up and focusing more on it. It eased you into it and the way of the world. But if you go back for a second viewing and you notice it, you can pick up on stuff in the very first few episodes. No, it it definitely uh, benefits from repeat viewings. So, what do you guys predict that's going to happen in the story? I predict I already know. <laughs> Spirit, you have to do a prediction beyond, beyond chapter one, what is it, 170? Beyond, beyond. Beyond the beyond. Uh, hmm. Oh, how about how about this? Like, Do you, do you guys think that Lagoshi and Haru are actually going to end up together? Yeah, hell yeah. Oh, I like that, hell yeah. <laughs> oh, I it's- don't know. I think it's going to be incredibly hard and there's going to be a lot of turbulence along the way. Well, I've read ahead of One Night, and I'm questioning it because um, there's a lot of scenes. It's going to let Legoshi and Haru stay together, and there's scenes where it's like giving them an opening to leave that relationship. So I'm still unsure. I see in the end end that, yeah, they're going to end up together, but there's going to be a lot of trials and turbulence along the way. Mm. But I don't know how (laughs) turbulent that ride is going to be because Beastars has already shown that it's not afraid to go to some dark places. Oh yeah, I mean, what we've already seen human trafficking. Yeah, we've seen human trafficking. We've seen ca- cannibalism. Mm-hmm. We've seen uh, murder for the sake of murder. We've seen racism. We've seen sexism. Mm-hmm. We've seen kind of prostitution. Yeah, self mutilation. Yeah, we've seen a lot of stuff, and I don't know. I see that being the ending. But I don't know what the full journey is going to be, but I'm enjoying the ride. It's really good. So we've seen that Louis is in the running to be a B-star. 
Beastar goes beyond the high school. It's not a huge spoiler, but it does go beyond the high school. And it looks like they're putting Louis as a in the running. But it also looks like they want Lagoshi to be a Beastar too. But that's he not his that goal. Down. He turned that down easily because it's yeah. a case of I don't really want attention brought on me. I was about to say, there's no way in hell he he wants to do that. <laughs> what if it's to protect Haru? Do you think he would be? No. I think he would. I don't think he would because it's a case of it would be still draw it'd be drawing more attention. Like he thinks, like with what's happened with the Shishigumi, he's like, yeah, I know I can protect her. But if it's anything that brings it even further into the spotlight, he'd be like, oh hell no. And if it honestly would put Haru in a lot of danger. I think he'd just walk away and leave her. I think he would because he is starting to have that sense of protectiveness and getting that mentality like Gohin, where he's going to have to take things in his own hands. He's going to have to bring justice in his own way. That's why I think he's going to is potentially going to be a V-star. That's what I think. Can I tell but, you something that I'd like to see, specifically in the manga? Yes. <laughs> I don't know if it's quite on topic, but... I'd like to see a version of the manga redone where it's basically the same, except the author gets her dad to draw all the fight scenes. <laughs> why? Yeah, why? Oh, you guys, you guys don't know about. Um, so, so the name of the uh, the mangaka is uh, Paru Itagaki. I think Paru might be a pseudonym. Itagaki is not. Because uh, her father is a uh, Keisuke Itagaki, the creator of Grappler Baki. What? Oh yeah, <laughs> I forgot about that. And I think she may have just gone under Paru until B Stars took off because she was trying to make a name, her own name. But now they'll like do publicity stuff with each other. Yeah. Okay. Now, yeah, I want to see that. Oh, I want to see that Bill and Lugosi fight drawn by him. Yeah, that would be because, nuts. Because that did have grappling in it. Mm-hmm. Damn. Speaking of fight scenes, um in the in the part where Lagoshi goes into the Shishigumi territory, in the manga, the lions were fighting with their paws, right? But in the anime, they were fighting with guns. Uh I wanna say a bit of both. Um it's definitely it's weird because like the fight seems to be much bigger in the manga. Things get a bit get way more over the top, which includes uh going going full Scarface on them. Like he straight up pulls out a belt fed machine gun and is like time to take out the trash. <laughs> I know I said that uh, we can do like a comparison of the manga and the anime for another episode, but I do want to point something out. Um I find it interesting that whenever Legoshi smells Haru, like gets her scent, and then they show that scene in the anime where his blood gets pumped up mm -hmm. and he goes into beast mode. Yep. And in the manga, they didn't do that. They just show that he's getting more feral. Mm -hmm. But in the anime, it looks like he's like powering up for something i'm like Dude. yeah it's it's, it's just a, it's a stylistic flourish for the for ultimately the same thing he's going even further beyond <laughs> and i remember when i first saw this with mikhail mikhail was like why is that happening what's going on and oh, he watched uh, it. no 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 he didn't watch it this is when he and i first saw like previews of it like this was like way back and i was and i read some of the manga already this is like before the manga was, I don't know, 100 chapters in. So I was trying to explain that, oh, this is him. This is how his adrenaline is running. They're showing his adrenaline through the anime. And, you know, adrenaline is hormones. Hormones going through the bloodstream. And, you know, the bloodstream is going through the muscles. And you're seeing him bulking up. You're seeing his veins. So they're trying to really portray the anime that moment. Mm-hmm. And Mikhail's like, why though? <laughs> All he's doing is smelling something. I'm like, I appreciate this artwork. <laughs> he he does an anime. Well, now that the whole series is out, I think he'll appreciate it more. He hasn't mm -hmm. watched it all yet, but I know he'll really like it because he likes characters who are complicated. 
<laughs> and there's there's a lot of layers to them. I'd like to see his review on Beach Stars. <laughs> <laughs> that could be good. We, we need Mikel on this just so he can d- describe Beach Stars to us. <laughs> Yeah, you did um bring up like one one more thing I wanted to mention, which is I just really like the uh, stylistic flourishes in the visuals of this show, both what they do with uh, Lagoshi reacting to smells, that weird like feral power up thing. And I think the one I like most though is the sort of like overlay of the event that you're looking at, like Lagoshi talking to uh, Haru, and it's like overlaid literally over his like his head kind of like reflecting how someone who is that internally focused views a conversation with someone and it just looks really neat that is true there were some scenes where i was wondering if he was saying everything in his head Mm -hmm. and then sometimes i'll see his mouth moving and i'm thinking wait is he actually telling her this stuff like wait what what why isn't how reacting to what he's saying what is going on Mm -hmm. and i'm just like you know what i'm just gonna take in this moment and see what happens next it, it, it has an interesting effect when you see him thinking so much while not saying anything in the actual conversation. It can almost replicate the anxiety he must be feeling in the viewer when you're just wanting him to literally say like even even a quarter of what he's thinking. It just shows how well written this show is. Mm-hmm. Earlier in this episode, we did touch on the subject of anime sub and dub. Yeah, we were talking about the comparison for our Beastars. So in this episode's question for the viewers, what do you prefer? Do you prefer anime sub or do you prefer anime dub? Let us know in the comments if the platform allows it. If not, there is the Superfina Discord with podcasts across worlds read. You can let us know in the anime section. I'm Lehua Superfina, host of Podcasts Across Worlds. You can find me on all social media platforms at Lehua Superfina. Weekly, I upload videos about video games, manga, and candy masks on youtube.com slash Lehua Superfina. I also stream every Tuesday, Thursdays, and Saturdays on twitch.tv slash Lehua Superfina. Hi, I'm Spirit Shot, co-host of Podcast Across Worlds and also content creator, streamer on the channel you'll find in the description. And one of the upcoming shows is Tinfoil Talks, where we deep dive into bullshit in video gaming. We take a topic and we find out how it got there, why it's there, come up with some excuse until we believe it ourselves, and then put it out into the stratosphere. And One Eye is also co-host on the said upcoming show. It's conspiracy, man. Total Tune conspiracy. In. We're only going to find out if you listen to us, man. Yeah, I know, man. I am... Uh... Lionel, a.k.a. One-Eye, a.k.a. Jumper Cables. Uh, Don't get too confused if you find me being called something else somewhere else. I just have too many nicknames. But uh, when I'm not here co-hosting on one of Lahua's or Spirit shows, I'm doing any number of shows on Hey Listen Radio. You can put heylistenradio.com in and you'll find it there. Or where we upload directly is soundcloud.com slash heylistenradio. I have a now dead anime podcast there. And we do have the live Hey Listen Radio show coming out weekly. On Twitter, I am currently not Jumper Cables at Otaku Connect. And that concludes our episode of Podcasts Across Worlds. Thank you all for tuning in. Keep reading manga, keep watching anime, and keep listening to Podcasts Across Worlds. We'll see you on the next episode. Since you're still here, how about leaving a like? And while you're at it, subscribe, ring the bell so you can get notifications. I want to give a huge, huge shout out to my Patreons and channel members because you all have been supporting the Superfina channel and it's not even required. So I really appreciate you. You are all in my heart. If you also want to support the Superfina channel, here's a link to the Patreon along with a list of social media. All the links are available in the description below. Thank you so much for watching this video. I have much love, much aloha for y'all, and I will see you later.